almost two and a half years ago, I was having lunch in the now defunct Sweet Tomatoes in Altamont Springs, I believe it is, with my old buddy Dick O'Phil. Some of you have been around long enough to know Dick O'Phil. He's the one who actually founded Men's Ministries in Florida nearly 20 years ago. And Dick is now in a nursing home in the final stages of Parkinson's. It's a short life, isn't it? But we met Dick and Rosa, Jay's wife, had worked together in the Florida Conference. And via her, was introduced to Jay. And Jay and Rosa are two of Stacy and I's closest friends. Who is Jay Cameron? I kind of introduced him in Sabbath school, but I'll say a couple more things. Jay's an attorney, actually I would call him the senior litigator for the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. If Adventists in the, in the area knew the import of what God is doing through this man here, this place would be standing room only. That's how important it is. What does the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms do? They defend freedom of so association. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Does, this, does that sound like any of those are under attack here? Well, Jay and I, Jay keeps telling me that Canada is farther down than we are. That's kind of hard for me to believe, but I do believe it. <laughs> Jay has uh, practiced in courtrooms in British Columbia, Manitoba, um, as well as Ontario and Nova Scotia. Very interesting case in Nova Scotia. I don't know what he's going to say today, but as well as his home the province of Alberta. And I really believe that God has, he calls himself a reluctant lawyer. But God has him here for such a time as this. And I pray that God will continue to use him mightily to stand in the breach because, Jay, I really hope you say something about this, how blessed we are in America. Our Declaration and Constitution gives us a greater barrier against all those intrusions than what they have in Canada. And for that reason alone, we, sh we as Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in supporting our founding documents. And so I pray, Brother Jay, as you speak to us today, that uh, God will anoint you mightily. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a, I, Rose and I have been very blessed by your church. We have been blessed by your fellowship. First time that we came back here, it was the first time we had been to a church service in three months. Uh, it brought tears to my eyes to sing song service that was uh, led by Patty. Patty, right? Uh, what was that? Four weeks ago or something like that? Five weeks ago. Uh, it's been a tremendous blessing to be here and to worship with you. It's a privilege and an honor to speak here today. And uh, Dale is right. I'm a reluctant lawyer. I, I, I love Florida. You're wondering why I'm down here in Florida. We have close ties with Florida. My wife is from Florida. Uh, her family is all from Florida down here. And I am much more content and at peace to be uh, um, exploring the Florida wilds and the, the creeks and the rivers. Uh, last week, a friend of mine and I from, uh, from a church close to uh, our house uh, caught a water moccasin, and uh, we were playing with it, and, uh, you know, uh, I love the alligators and the, and the creeks and the swamps, and I just love it down here. So I'm a reluctant lawyer, uh, it's true, but uh, I'm blessed um, to be involved in some, some interesting cases, some important cases, and uh, before I get going here, I'll just tell you just a, a short story about something that happened yesterday. Uh, I rescued this dog uh, 10 years ago plus. She's a good dog. Uh, 
Uh, I bought her and her sisters uh, from a trucker in northern BC, and uh, we they were all wormy and, and disgusting and starving and vicious little things. Uh, and uh, we bought them and we, we vaccinated them, cleaned them up, fed them, watered them, loved them, rehomed two of them, and I kept this dog. And she'd been like my shadow. Uh, she's been like my shadow for the last uh, 10 years plus. She follows me everywhere where I go. She's always with me if she can be. She'd be right here on the podium if uh, she was allowed in the, in the church, which of course she's not. And uh, yesterday some peacocks flew over the back of the house and they were in the front of the house and my wife was feeding them. And uh, she called me and she was all excited for the peacocks. And uh, come and see the peacocks. And so I went outside and uh, as I went to open the door, this dog, who I love, who I, uh, she's my companion, um, you know, she, she's with me everywhere I go, but I cannot teach her not to chase stuff and to kill stuff. And she is like death with any living thing that comes around the house. And she somehow got past me and she went after those peacocks, there was about ten of them. And you know, those peacocks, they were there, you know, they were there in trust and goodwill and enjoying themselves, eating out of my wife's hand. They were praising the Lord and then all of a sudden this, this four-legged fiend came out of the house to attack them. And immediately they went up because there was danger. They went up and praised the Lord. Not one of them perished yesterday. When there is danger around, it behooves us to go up. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's go up right now. We'll pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you see all of the things that are going on on this earth. There's nothing that's hidden from you. You see our personal lives. You see our needs. You see our wants. Lord, you see our struggles. Lord, we want to be Christians in our heart. Not on paper, not in a book, not with outward formality, but in our hearts. And Lord, that's a supernatural work. That's a supernatural work alone, Lord. And Father, we ask the creator of the universe today to come into our hearts and into the presence of this place to recreate our hearts and our minds in his image, in your image. Jesus' name. So I, I could I, I debated about what to talk about today. Probably only have one opportunity. Uh, might never be asked back, especially if I go way over. Uh, so I debated what I was going to talk about today. I could talk to you about a great many things that are going on in Canada. I will touch briefly on some of them. Like Dale said, the trajectory of things in Canada is in a swift and a steep decline. Canada has a constitution that is somewhat similar to the U.S. Constitution. And the first words in it is that Canada is a nation founded by, founded on the rule of law and the supremacy of God. And those two ideas, um, that, that God is supreme and that there is a rule of law which governs the kingdoms of men, right, that is supposed to be established and discernible and reliable is something that protects society. Because if you don't have the rule of law, you have people who uh, are in power and they make laws in accordance with their own arbitrary notions and their own corrupt hearts. And you have a judiciary that is not able to establish a demarcation about whether or not the government infringed a right or whether it didn't, because it doesn't know what the law is. And so, uh, there's a verse in Proverbs 22, verse 28, which says, uh, I'm just going to turn there, actually, uh, Proverbs 22, verse 28. And it says, Remove not the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. 
do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And those landmarks establish the perimeter and the parameters of the kingdom and of somebody's land and of somebody's house, their prosperity and their, um, their property. And the Bible says, when your fathers established these boundaries, you were not to move them. And the boundaries that were established in the United States of America, uh, which I love, um, my father is an American, I uh, identify strongly with uh, my U.S. side and my family. Um, the boundaries which were established in this nation have been a safeguard for the last 200 plus years. And they are being broken down and they are being removed to the peril of the land. And the Bible says, do not remove them. The same thing is happening in Canada, and the decline is even faster than it is down here. So I'll just, I'll tell you, I don't want to take up all of the time I have here, but just in five or six minutes, I'm going to tell you about some of the things that are going on in Canada. In 2014, uh, 2000 and 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada redefined the definition of marriage to be from a man and a woman to two people. And that, when, when that change came in, the country was told, don't worry, there will be protections for religious liberty. What has happened is, is that the removal of that landmark has led to the removal of others. And so when a, a Canadian law school wanted to establish a religious law school, the first of its kind in Canada, you think to yourself, how could that be the first of its kind in Canada? The United States has many religious law schools. All the law schools in Canada to this day are, are secular. They're run by the state. There was a Christian university, Trinity Western University, they wanted to establish a Christian law school. And they said, we have a community covenant. And the community covenant says, we bind ourselves to follow the requirements of God. We're not going to uh, watch bad movies, watch pornography, be involved in, uh, watch violent movies. Um, we're not going to be committing adultery. Uh, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, abstain from swearing on the campus. We want this to be a Christian university. We covenant to come together on these principles. And the Supreme Court of Canada ruled uh, in 2001 that Trinity Western could associate around the community covenant. And that it could exclude students based on their particular religious beliefs. And so they said, uh, we want, uh, Trinity said, one of the things that we want students to agree to do is to abstain from sexual relations that are not between a married man and a married woman. And so the Supreme Court of Canada in 2001 said, they have a right to associate around that. That's a principle that is a freedom of religion, that's freedom of association. If, if they want to hold to that covenant, the government cannot withhold accreditation for their education program just because they have this policy. Yes, it, it, it says to some students, you can't have sexual relations if you're not married to a member of the opposite sex. But the Supreme Court said that's, that's lawful. In 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada redefined the nature of the, the definition of marriage. And when Trinity decided it wanted to have a law school, Law Society of British Columbia said you cannot have a law school because you discriminate against people who are, uh, their, their sexual identity is geared towards same-sex uh, attraction, homosexual relations. That case went all the way back to the Supreme Court of Canada and Trinity Western lost. And the government said it is justified, the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada said it is justifiable because you're discriminating against gays and lesbians, that you cannot have accreditation for your law school. 
And so that one change made a huge difference. And I can tell you about other cases. Many people, I represented a client who had lost his license to solemnize marriages. And when he obtained his license, the state said, you only, if you want to only do Christian uh, marriages, we're going to keep you on a separate list of people. You won't be public. You're going to be allowed to solemnize marriages in accordance with the beliefs of your conscience. That's fine. So because he had said, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to marry Hindus or Muslims or atheists or Wiccans. I believe that marriage is a religious institution established by God. I only want to, I only want to marry the people that I'm in contact with in my ministry. He ministers to bikers, drug addicts. Sometimes they want to get married because they're convicted. And the state said that's fine. But when the Supreme Court of Canada changed the definition of marriage, it's uh, the the province of Manitoba sent out a letter saying, if you are not willing to solemnize a marriage of a homosexual couple, you cannot be licensed in the province of Manitoba. So we fought that. And we lost. And the court said, the Court of Appeal of Manitoba said, this is an infringement of religious freedom. But it's justified. It's justified. Why is it justified? It's justified because the landmarks changed. The boundaries have been removed. In 2016, uh, a, a bill was introduced federally in Canada to add the protect, uh, protections along with race, and religion, and sex, sexual orientation because of what they did with the redefinition of, uh, of marriage. They, they decided to add gender identity and gender expression. What is gender identity and gender expression? That's that you might be born biologically as a male, but in the process of time you come to this epiphany. And you say to yourself, I'm not really a male, I'm a woman. And so the Supreme, uh, the, the, the federal government in Canada added that gender identity and gender expression as a protection in, in the federal human rights uh, code. And all of the provinces followed suit. Because of that, you can legally identify as a member of the opposite sex and claim discrimination if you are refused service on the basis of your gender identity. So you think to yourself, well, how does that work? Nobody should be refused service, right? Whether or not you think you're a male or a female, you shouldn't be, a, you know, if you go to Walmart, somebody should still sell you a bag of Doritos, right? Nobody should discriminate against you. But what happens if the service is specific to feed the female body? So I was involved in cases, in fact, I'm still involved in cases, where somebody who is identified as a woman wants to have an intimate service that is for women. He says, you can't refuse me because I'm a woman. And the, the salon in question says, well, you're not a woman biologically. You have male parts. And the individual says, well, the law says I can identify However I want. Being female is a social construct. It's not a biological reality. I can identify as a woman and you must treat me as a woman for the purposes of service. And that is, that is something which has worked uh, confusion in Canada. Because it is the removal of an old boundary. And so you have children being told you aren't male or female. In fact, we're involved in a case where a child was told uh, her classroom, she's seven years old, six or seven years old, and the teacher came in one day and, and drew a line on the board and said, over here is female, over here is male, but in between there's this broad expanse, this spectrum, where you're partly male or you're, and you're partly female, right? I want you to come up here and put your X on the board where, you're, where you are, right? Are you more female than male? Are you more male than female? 
So the students came up one after the other and they made their little X on the line. And then our client's daughter came up to the board, seven years old, six years old, something like that. I can't remember, I think she was seven. And she put her X over here on the left as far as you could by the F, female, X, <laughs> right there. And went and sat down. And the teacher said, you've put your X in the wrong place. There's no such thing as male and female. There's no such thing. Everybody is either part, is somewhere on the spectrum. And the, the student was upset. She went home and she said to her mom, why am I not a male? Why am I not female? Why are females not real? Because the teacher had said females aren't real. There's no such thing. Right? You're either partly male or partly female or more female or more male. You're on the spectrum, but there's no such thing as purely female. That's, that's something that doesn't exist. But she says, why, why don't I exist? Why am I not real? Seven years old. This chair is real. This table is real. I'm a girl. Why am I not real? She talked about it for months afterwards. Finally, they pulled her out of school and put her in a different school that believes in male and female. But you would think, 15 years ago, you would say, this, this, this can never happen. We were involved in a case where a man had sent out some flyers and uh, he had said in the flyers that one of the candidates running for political office was not a female but was a male. Biologically, that's true. The individual in question had uh, grown up as male, been born as male, grown up as male, fathered two children, been in a marriage with a woman, and at the age of 46 decided that he was a woman. So he left his family, left his children, changed his name, and ran for political office as a woman. And uh, the flyers in question said, this is not a, a woman, this is a man. This is the history of this man. And uh, the Bible says that you can, you know, God created male and female. And uh, so the, the politician in question filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission, which are these, these commissions to guard human rights in Canada. Increasingly what they guard is uh, these types of progressive rights. And they're geared towards the upholding of progressive ideology uh, more and more. And uh, the matter came to a hearing. And, and the tribunal said, all right, I want it to be known that in this hearing you will refer to the complainant, who is the politician, as she and her, because the person who had sent up the flyer said, well, that's a he, right? He said, he said this, he said this, right? You know? And the tribunal said, you will refer to this individual as she. And the person who sent up the flyer said, well, I'm not referring to him as her, because he's a he. He said, that's a guy, right? And there's no amount of you telling me that I'm going to do something, that I'm going to refer to a man as a woman. I'm not doing that. And uh, he, he filed an application for a medical exam, and uh, the Human Rights Tribunal said, that's irrelevant. And uh, he said, well, this is the truth. The fact is, is he's a man. And the tribunal said, the truth is not relevant to this question. The truth is not relevant to this question. You will refer to him, or you will refer to her as her, because she's a she. And so, um, that's where we are. And I could tell you story after story after story. I just maybe two more to show you how quickly things are declining. Uh, because of COVID-19, the, the federal government, um, you know, the Congress wasn't sitting for a while because the Democrats refused to sit, right? And uh, the Democrats said, unless you put a mask on, we're not sitting, right? And they were all mad at the Republicans, you're not wearing a mask, right? So the Democrats refused to sit. And, and it, up in Canada, the Liberals refused to sit for Parliament, right? And so they're governor, governing by, basically like, uh, by ministerial fiat, right? Whatever we say is the law, that's the law. And, and so uh, it's a very dangerous thing when you do that because you subvert democracy, right? Because you have a system of democracy where you have representatives of the population come and they make laws for the population <coughs> after some debate, after study. 
But in Canada, what's happening right now, and still happening, is that there's no legislative agenda because, uh, because of COVID-19, ostensibly. And uh, so one of the things that the government has done is to, to pander to the people in their, in their group. They have reclassified, and this happened overnight, reclassified 1,500 firearms. And they said, these are now illegal. They used to be legal, now they're illegal. And this happened overnight. No study, no debate, no warning, just bam. All the things that you have, you, you thought were legal in your, in your uh, collection, right? And this is private property, Even irrespective of how you feel about gun rights, and I know you're American, so you have your own particular views on gun rights, <laughs> how important they are. The government said, no, we're redefining things. I'll give you another example. It's a constitutional right to leave the country and enter the country. But now the law is you have to have a passport to do it. So what does the government say? We're not processing any passport applications. You show us that your matter is urgent. You're not allowed to cross the border anyways. You're supposed to be sitting at home socially distancing. You prove to us that your matter is urgent and we'll renew your passport. Otherwise, you can just stay in the country or stay out of the country, as the case may be. Okay, and so you have a constitution that establishes safeguards. And if you want to know about all of the cases that uh, are going on, uh, you can go to the Justice Center's website and you can have a look. Now, I'm going to run through a list of some of the landmarks. And uh, Brother Ricky said that I could go to 1230, so Amen. Bu buckle up. <laughs> all right. Liberty of conscience is a landmark. Mm -hmm. The United States was founded on liberty of conscience, right? And closely related to uh, liberty of conscience is freedom of speech, right? The ability to believe and to worship and to disseminate your beliefs in accordance with your religion. And those are sacrosanct principles in the United States. Liberty of conscience, where does it come from? Is it a biblical principle? Absolutely it is. The Lord said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And even before he said that, the same person said, I am the Lord your God who has brought you out of the house of bondage and out of slavery to serve me. And that is the first part of the Ten Commandments. Amen. It's written in stone. So before you even have thou shalt, you have, I am the Lord your God who has brought you to myself. I did that apart from you. I rescued you. I reached out and I brought you to myself. It's like me rescuing that dog. That dog was ugly and wormy and miserable and I reached out. She didn't do anything to commend herself to me. She was a vicious little... Uh, wormy dog. I reached out and I rescued her. I brought her to myself. And I cleaned her up. Why? Because I loved her. And the Lord, He doesn't wait for us to come to Him. He sent the person of His Son to make reconciliation on behalf of God and man on our behalf. And the two become one in the person of Christ Jesus. And that that is an established fact. In Christ, there is reconciliation. And you believe that. It's not like it happens when you believe. You believe it to the saving of your soul. Because in the person of Christ, it is an accomplished thing. And it becomes reality to you when you repent and you believe. But the, the action was God's first. He reached out and grabbed us in the person of Christ. Amen. So liberty of conscience is a landmark. Freedom of speech is a landmark. Moses said, I can't go speak. Lord, who am I? I can't go speak. Who am I to open my mouth? And the Lord said, who made men's mouth? Did the state make your mouth? Did Pharaoh make your mouth? Who made your mouth? I made your mouth. And I will open your mouth to speak. Look at the other things in a, aside that are also landmarks. There is marriage, 
Jesus said, have you not read from the beginning, Matthew 19, 14, how I made male and female, and how I joined them together, what God has joined, let nobody put asunder, right? And so he established.